Hello, my name is Christina Davis. I'm the director of the program on US-Japan relations. Thank you so much for joining us here in the evening in Boston and for those of you joining from Japan in the morning. We're really excited to welcome you to our first panel to kick off the 2022-23 academic year. We have a wonderful set of speakers to discuss a very important topic, Shinzo Abe and Japan's 21st century. Two months ago, we were all shocked, saddened by Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's assassination. In a country with so little violence, to see a brutal assassination was indeed truly shocking. And this event took place while he was campaigning for the election in Nara. He was a great leader for Japan's political system who led from 2006 to 2007 as prime minister and again from 2012 to 2020, making him the longest serving prime minister in Japanese history. Under his leadership, the LDP won six consecutive national elections. He was at once an old school politician, grandson to former prime minister Nobosuke, Nobosuke Kishi, leader of the largest faction within the conservative party. He was also a new style leader who put forward an ambitious policy agenda and foreign policy. His abenomics became a well-known term discussing monetary expansion, fiscal stimulus and structural reforms as a way to try and break Japan out of a cycle of economic downturn. For myself as someone who studies trade policy, I was pleased to see Japan take a more active role in shaping the free trade rules of East Asia and contribute to building support for the World Trade Organization at a time when it was being pilloried by many other leaders around the world. When President Trump withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership in 2017, Prime Minister Abe played a central role to lead other countries to go forward, forming this free trade agreement renamed Comprehensive Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. After decades of Japan being the last to join free trade agreements, here, after the US backed away, Japan stepped forward. He also played a pivotal role in diplomacy of East Asia, developing the concept of free, open Indo-Pacific and initiating the Quad, a regional group comprising the United States, Japan, India, and Australia, which has been an important forum for opening new conversations on a range of issues important in the region and in confronting the challenges presented from China. Of course, Prime Minister Abe's nationalist policies were provocative. Japan's relations with South Korea reached their lowest point in decades. His relations with the United States were very strong as he dedicated himself to strengthening the US-Japan alliance. But his constitutional reinterpretation allowed exercise of collective self-defense in 2015 to the praise of American defense officials and criticism on, by many on the left in Japan. Here at Harvard, we were fortunate to hear him speak in 2015, where he gave an address to the Harvard's Kennedy School Institute of Politics prior to visiting Washington DC, where he was the first Japanese prime minister to deliver a speech to a joint session of the US Congress. His legacy is complex for he has had many roles and we are fortunate today to discuss both the legacy of Shinzo Abe and the impact of his death for the future of Japanese politics. We have two great scholars joining us. Our first speaker is Professor Jennifer Lind, Associate Professor of Government at Dartmouth College. Professor Lind received her PhD in political science from that other university in Cambridge, MIT. She has published extensively on East Asian security the U.S.-Japan Alliance, and issues of historical memory. She's the author of the book, Sorry States, Apologies in International Politics, and has published articles in a range of the top security journals, International Security, International Studies Quarterly, and she bridges the academy and policy, having published in Foreign Affairs, National Interest in the New York Times, Financial Times, 
in a way that is so difficult to both engage in theoretical debates and policy discussion. We are really happy to have here, her here today. And she will be joined by Professor Koichi Nakano, who is Professor of Comparative Politics at Sophia University. I'm very proud that he was a political science PhD student graduate of Princeton University. And I was happy to be the outside reviewer of his dissertation where he showed his incredible insights in studying bureaucratic politics in a comparative perspective. This work from his dissertation went on to be published as a highly acclaimed book, Party Politics, Decentralization in Japan and France, When the Opposition Governs. He's continued to look at party politics, analyzing Japanese politics with a book written in Japanese on the trend towards the rightward shift of Japanese politics, Ukeika Tsuru Nihon Seiji, published in 2015. Together with Yoichi Hunabashi, he is the co-editor of a book on the Democratic Party of Japan, looking at its challenges and failures. We are so happy to have these two esteemed scholars to discuss the theme today. And our event is co-sponsored by the Edwin O. Reischauer Institute of Japanese Studies and the Harvard Undergraduate Japan Policy Network, a new student group that is dedicated to the study of Japanese politics and policies and increasing interest among undergraduates at Harvard and in the world in studying Japanese politics. <laughs> I'd like to first introduce our event for next week and then we'll turn over to our uh, presenters. Next week, we will be talking about Japan, South Korea and US alliance politics in East Asia with Suemi Terry and Junya Nishino. We hope you can join us for another evening event on Monday, September 26th. And now reminding you of Zoom etiquette and housekeeping. We would like to ask that you submit your questions in the Q&A so that I can uh, moderate the Q&A after our speakers finish their presentations. Each of our speakers will talk for about 15 minutes and then we'll open up to questions. So please do post your questions in the um, Q&A section. Thank you so much. I'll start off, uh, Professor Lund. Hi, thank you so much. And, and Christina, thank you so much for that really warm introduction. It's it's an honor to be on your, your first panel of the season. And it's an honor to be here with Nakano Sensei, who is one of the many colleagues over in Japan that I have missed seeing for a long time. So it's it's great to at least be brought together in this way. So I have been tasked with talking about Shinzo Abe and Japanese foreign and security policy. And then um, we will hear from Nakano-san about more of the domestic politics. And, and obviously there's lots of overlap. So I'll be very interested to see the directions that we go tonight. So when you, when you talk with some people about Shinzo Abe, you hear the view that he was a visionary and a, a great diplomat and a strong proponent of the status quo in Asia, the liberal international order. And in this view, his efforts to change Japan's, Japan's security policy and to, to repair a perceived fraying international order were seen very much as motivated by, again, a, a desire to preserve the status quo, a kind of a defensive mindset and, and great pragmatism and moderation. So that's, that's one view that you'll frequently hear of Abe. Now there's another view that you'll hear and, and they see him as an extremist, as somebody who's trying to change Japan dramatically, uh, pushing for positions on the, the, the right fringe of Japanese politics and security policy. And um, you know, in many people's eyes, again, pushing for a, a more hawkish or even militaristic foreign policy that many Japanese uh, criticized. So again, you, you hear both of these views about the same person. And I'm going to argue that, that actually there's a lot of truth to both of these views. Um, Abe did transform Japan and he wanted to transform Japan still further. And, and yet, 
his views were not extreme, but were quite pragmatic. And the, the reasons why both of these views can be true is because of where Japan started when he came on the scene. That is where Japan's initial security policy was on the, the general continuum that we can think about as being further to the left or further to the right. So I would argue that because Japan started off with a very extreme left kind of a foreign policy, and then when, when conservatives like Abe and particularly Abe himself came on the scene, uh, movements to the right represented not a push to the far right, but really a push toward the center. So of course, if, if somebody starts off pretty conservative and they, they move toward the right, then they're going to be really quite on the extreme. Um, but if somebody starts in a far left position and then you push them toward the, 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 the right, obviously um, they're gonna end up somewhere around the center. And again, that's where, where I argue that Abe pushed Japan. So let me see if I can successfully share my slides here. Okay, so um, I want to talk about um, some specifics of Japanese security policy under Abe. And um, I'll, I'll start off by, by saying in, in the defense spending and also a few other defense policy realms, just again, where did, defense, where, where did Japan start off and where did Abe push Japan and then where did Japan end up? For defense spending, we often see um, headlines like this. So the Wall Street Journal talking about Japan's record-setting defense spending, Bloomberg talking about Prime Minister Abe coming in and initiating a U-turn in Japanese policy with its higher defense outlays. And then also we see in the diplomat talking about the largest defense budget ever, you know, record-breaking and so on. And so um, what's, you know, those are the headlines, but what actually is going on when you look at the data? So as, as you see with the, the line here, uh, the dotted line, um, Japan spends about 1% of GDP on defense. So defense as a percentage of GDP is essentially a measurement of, of how hard a country is trying at that particular category. So the level of effort that the country is making, in this case, on defense. And so historically, we see um, going way back that Japan has, has been spending really quite consistently around 1% of GDP. And then if you look at this other chart with the bars, you see Japan compared to several other countries in terms of um, the, let's see, it's the zoom is obscuring my, legend here. Um, so we have 2019 in black and 2000 in the stripes and then 1988 during the Cold War in the gray. And then essentially what we see is Japan spent the least or, or in terms of again of level of effort how hard Japan is trying in that realm of defense. In 1988 during the Cold War Japan spent the least and then after Abe what do we see but Japan spends the least. So uh, this is a major indicator of, of military assertiveness. And we see that Japan has the least, least assertive posture of, of any of the countries that I see that I've showed you here. And so going back to that Bloomberg headline, um, it kind of makes you wonder what is this U-turn that, that they're talking about that Shinzo Abe was said to perform with defense spending because that's a flat line. Um, I mean, we can talk about GDP growth over time, and uh, sometimes GDP, GDP is growing more quickly and so on, but the, the past several years were, were not an example of that. Um, so this is all the more interesting because we see, we see changes in um, Japan's security environment. So Japan's share of regional military expenditure has been going down. So here we see um, 1975 in the black, 1990 in the gray, and then more recently in the, the light color. And uh, you see that Japan used to spend over a third of regional military expenditure, 
and, and that's down under 10% now. So Japan's security environment, uh, we can call it an arms race, we can call it more dangerous, whatever you want to say, um, but Japan's share of regional military expenditure is significantly smaller relative to the past. So that's another really important detail with respect to defense spending, which is what's going on in the broader security environment. And then one other thing that I'll just point out is that um, with, with respect to the size of Japan's military, um, the, the small size of Japan's military forces here are evident when you look at the, let's see, it's the dash line down toward the bottom. Um, and then the one of the closer countries toward it you'll see is, is actually Israel, which has a 10th of Japan's population and yet about the same size in terms of military personnel, in terms of number of military forces. So, um, so again, if you, if you look at all these, these different data, you, you certainly don't see evidence for headlines that something truly transformative is going on here, at least when it comes to how hard Japan is trying um, and, and certainly how big Japan's military is. So let's turn now to some other areas where we can ask what's been the transformation that we're seeing in Japan uh, as we're talking about Shinzo Abe's policies over time. So another issue to talk about would be institutional constraints. Um, Japan, I would argue, if you look at a variety of constraints on a country's ability to mobilize military forces or project power abroad, Japan um, used to be the most constrained country uh, certainly compared to any of the ones that I examined that I show you, showed you on that chart a moment ago, in terms of restrictions on the, the influence of the military in politics and in terms of its ability to project power overseas. And overall, um, this has changed somewhat. There have been changes in um, the institutional environment, the, the defense institutions in Japan that are very important. Uh, again, when you focus on where Japan was and where Japan is now, you do see some really interesting changes. So for example, Article 9 of the Constitution, um, this, this used to be interpreted in a way that was so severe, it didn't even permit Japan to have uh, national self-defense. And so that very quickly was, was deemed um, actually um, against the UN Charter and, and as not appropriate for, for a, a sovereign nation. And so that was reinterpreted. And we saw that reinterpreted over time, multiple times, um, um, allowing, again, a, a different view of what was constitutional, what kind of activities, weaponry, and so on were constitutional and what was not. And of course, Abe presided over one of these interpretations in 2014. Another important defense law was the 1954 Self-Defense Forces Law, which prohibited the dispatch of SDF personnel overseas. And we saw changes in this over time as well. So famously with 1991, the Peacekeeping Operations Act, and then several different laws subsequently that authorized Japan to, for example, uh, perform rear area support within the alliance and so on. There was a 1969 diet resolution on the military use of space. And this was also reinterpreted over time, uh, particularly at the occasion of a North Korean uh, rocket test uh, over Japanese airspace, and then subsequently with the, the space bill. So um, I could go on and on, which I'm sure all of you would love, uh, but there have been many, many changes in Japan's defense institutions over time. Um, you know, reforms elevating the defense agency to a defense ministry are important. Uh, the instigation, and, and this was under Abe of the National Security Council and of an amphibious force modeled on the U.S. Marine Corps, it was in 2014. So there's, there's so many different incremental changes that we could point to. So what do we take from all this? So first, I would argue that it's important to note that, that many of these, of course, preceded Abe. And so we see Abe is really fitting in with a gradual evolution in Japan over time in terms of its security policy and the, the kind of behavior and the kind of weaponry and so on 
that the Japanese people have have viewed as being uh, acceptable given its its constitution and its other legal constraints. And, and the second thing to point out is that um, Abe presided over the shift from a country with very severe uh, constraints on the use of force to somewhat less severe <laughs> constraints on the, the mobilization and the use of force. In an article I co-authored with Chikako Ueki of Waseda, uh, we compare Japan to a variety of countries, the, the ones I listed on the chart before, and concluded that Japan's constraints on the use of force were the most strict, the most stringent of any of those countries. And so, so again, um, that's a very important context for understanding these changes. Certainly the context of Japanese politics is important context. And as I said, there have this is within that context does represent change over time. But there's another context here too, which is the world and how countries in the world behave. And, and there, again, um, Japan still is very much on the, the highly restrained side of the spectrum. And so the, the words that we see in headlines like hawkish or militarist, um, they're just not accurate descriptions of, of this landscape. Um, Japan has, has moved from, from again, from the extreme left to you know, basically more closer to the center. And that certainly doesn't mean that Japan is hawkish or, or militarist. So let me now turn to the issue of, of national identity. Um, in, in this area, Abe, as, as Christina mentioned before, Abe was particularly controversial. And I've, I've done a lot of research on the subject of nationalism and war memory. And after World War II, Japan, like most countries, uh, generally avoided thinking about the thinking about teaching about and, and debating about the violence that it committed toward other countries in the years of war and occupation. And Japanese teachers and many scholars and others on the left over the years argued for a liberal approach in which uh, Japan should be thinking about and debating and, and teaching young people about wartime atrocities. Um, but this approach was, was not very popular and certainly was not taken up by the conservative governments that, that dominated Japan after World War II. In the 1990s, the issue of the war became prominent for a variety of reasons we can talk about. Uh, and the first socialist prime minister, Murayama, offered apologies and, and tried to initiate a, a official diet resolution about the war and so on. And other prime ministers, in, including from the LDP, followed uh, his example and offered apologies, notably to South Korea, um, to try and broker a reconciliation. Um, these gestures, as, as well as, as debates over history textbooks, were of course, as you all know, very controversial. So liberals in Japan, as in other countries, favor examining the country's violent past, its, its mistakes, as a, as a way to strengthen the country and to promote peace with other countries and particularly with, with wartime opponents and, and victims. Conservatives, however, uh, see this focus on negative history as something that weakens the country, uh, both internally by leading to less national pride and unity, and also with respect to other countries. So when I look at Japan, I see a country that has big divisions between liberals and conservatives about how to remember the past, um, just like what I see in my own country. And um, you know what we see in in France and Israel and and basically most everywhere. And when I look at Abe, I see someone who occupies the conservative side of that debate. However, it's it's simply not accurate to say that Abe is you know a you know right wing arch conservative as National Public Radio in in the U.S. earned a lot of criticism for labeling him recently. Um, Absolutely, there are aspects of Abe's policies that are very pleasing to conservatives, such as the visit to Yasukuni Shrine that I have pictured here. 
And there are also aspects of his policies that are actually left of center, such as some pretty conciliatory language that he used in many of his speeches, uh, notably on the 70th, 70th anniversary at the end of World War II. Uh, in that speech, Abe regretted Japan's brutal treatment of the peoples of Asia and pledged to forever commit to peace. Now, to be clear, um, in, in most other countries, it's, it's pretty unheard of for conservatives to talk like this, um, you know, to talk about the violence that they committed against their former wartime opponents. And particularly in my country, um, American conservatives celebrate American bravery and they, they celebrate uh, American wartime actions as, as aimed toward this kind of um, righteous goal. And so they, they don't talk about, here are the people that we, we treated so brutally in the war and isn't important that we remember them. So, um, so many people on the left say they should, but, but you know that's not my point here is to say which is right. But my point is to say that this is kind of garden variety conservatism is to, to emphasize you know, patriotism, what are the good things that our country has done, and to not really talk a whole lot about the, about the violence inflicted on our wartime opponents. So, um, so Abe's 70th anniversary speech had elements from the left that I would say, and of course the, the people on the left weren't pleased with it because they wanted him to go further. They wanted him to, to issue the kind of speech that they felt good about. Um, and, and he didn't do that. And of course, that's their right. You know, if liberals can say, we want him to say this, and, and they can try to hold him to that standard and say, we think that this is the correct place for you to be in the way that you should talk about the past. Um, but the, the fact that he doesn't talk about it the way they want him to doesn't make him an extreme arch conservative on the far right. All right, so, so let me wrap up here. Um, so I've talked about national identity. I've talked about institutional constraints and, and I've talked about defense spending. And, and let me reiterate that um, when liberals critique Abe uh, for moving Japan's security policy to the right, they're not wrong. He, he did, <laughs> or he, he certainly tried. He tried to move it further to the right. Um, so in this view, the the the, the policies, um, the, the the policies that the liberals had in mind, they liked the place where Japan started out. They liked the the far extreme left where Japan had initially started out, and they thought it was better for Japan, healthier for Japan, and better for the world that Japan should stay over on that side of the spectrum. They might be right. I mean, we, we just don't know yet. So, um, but my other point is that um, because Japan's security posture started off so far over to the left, Abe only man managed to move it just toward the center to basically around the area, you know, the kind of a center left where we see the, the green parties in, in Europe. So, you know, let's be clear, the Greens would feel pretty good about Shinzo Abe's security policy. Um, small defense spending, no military activism abroad, no nuclear weapons on their soil, uh, no offensive use of force, you know, um, no independent use of force. Uh, the, the Greens in Germany, the Greens in, in, in France, they, they would say, Abe's our guy, this sounds, this sounds great. Um, as would probably many on the progressive side in the Democratic Party. So um, that's the place that, that Abe and others have brought Japan to this day. Uh, again, to, to being still highly conflicted and, and reluctant to use force, um, barely willing to do the, um, to, to do and even in the context of multilateral alliances to do military operations, um, but more willing than Japan has been in the past to, to take steps to provide for Japan's security. 
Now, what do we think of all this? What do we think of Abe's policies of the actual, were they right, were they wrong? Putting aside this whole, where were they on the continuum thing? Um, so if you're on the left, you would think that, that Abe has mistakenly moved Japan away from a sensible place that made a lot of, of good sense for Japan to, to keep its policy, a highly restrained pacifist security policy. Um, and that's where Japan should stay. And so it was a mistake to move it away from that location. Um, if you're a centrist, then you're probably pretty happy. You probably think that Japan, that sorry, that Abe has improved Japan's security stance, um, but that we have to wait and see what happens next. Uh, if you're actually a conservative, then you would look at what China's doing and you'd look at what Japan is doing and what Abe did. And you'd probably say Japan still has to do a lot more to get serious about providing for its security. So I'll stop there and I very much look forward to our conversation tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Fantastic to have that broader context of thinking about Prime Minister Abe, both relative to other countries in his defense spending and his nationalist policies. Thank you for providing that perspective. And now we're going to turn it over to Professor Nakano. Please go ahead. Hey, thank you. Um, thank you, Jennifer. Um, and um, well, I will be focusing more on domestic politics uh, today, but uh, you'll probably notice that my view is rather contrasting with what Jennifer just talked about. And I'm sort of, you know, uh, once again, a little bit surprised by the difference a perspective can make. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I really look forward to the discussions uh, tonight. I mean, there are two things that I guess, you know, uh, I'm sort of um, looking at this uh, very differently. And one has to do with the fact that, um, sorry, I'll try to enlarge this into a full screen. Um, so um, what, one thing is to do with the, um, the assertion that um, Jennifer was making that Japan comes from the far left and a little bit sort of uh, taken aback by that uh, sort of you know, uh, phrase. Uh, because of course, yes, Japan has a pacifist constitution, but that didn't come out of nowhere. It's to do with the uh, horror of the Second World War and the Japanese atrocities. And also, one should understand that if you get two atomic bombs dropped on your soil, people tend to be on the far left of the political spectrum uh, to begin with in matters to do with war. Uh, and so, yes, um, if you compare Japan to the US, to the UK, and to Israel, for example, yes, of course, Japan is on the left of the political spectrum militarily. I really do sincerely wish, I hope, you know, I'm not going to offend anybody who's uh, from Israel today, but I'd rather not Japan turn into an Israel of the uh, East Asia, to be honest, uh, for various reasons. Uh, and um, so, yeah, we have a disagreement on that part, I think, uh, although I do see the logic and I have heard the argument uh, before. Uh, the part that I sort of you know, focus on today is more to do with the institutional check uh, on, the, uh, on the military, because that's what I specialize in. It's about domestic governance and it's about the principles of uh, the rule of law, constitutionalism, uh, democratic check and balance, accountability. And these you know, sort of safeguards uh, in the political system have been uh, broken uh, by Abe. Uh, over the past years. And I also uh, hasten to note, just like Jennifer said, uh, until Abe came to power, there has already been these tendencies. So it's not like Abe started it, although uh, I do argue that he changed in terms of the qualitative uh, difference uh, that Japan uh, has itself today. Uh, but anyway, so let me uh, go on with the slides. Well, and that's also, I think the difference in perception is also why you see such a big controversy over the state funeral in Japan right now. Ishida appointed, uh, gave four justifications. You can see them here. Uh, one including, uh, you know, uh, having a strategic uh, diplomacy, particularly focusing on US-Japan relations. And yes, uh, Western countries, many countries express condolences. And uh, however, the domestic public reactions have been very negative. And in fact, the opposition to the state funeral have gone 
you know, uh, further and further over time. The latest polls indicate that the opposition is now above 60%, even in the Sanke Fuji poll. Uh, and uh, Ishida's uh, support levels has also uh, gone down to such an extent that it's lower than the, uh, uh, the disapproval rate is higher than the approval rate. And, um, uh, you know, a large part of the background of it is to do with uh, a rather negative assessment of Abe's legacy, uh, in addition to the opposition to the state funeral itself, or the undemocratic way that the uh, state funeral was decided by Kishida, uh, on top of the LDP's ties with the Unification uh, Church. Um, and um, yeah, we can go into more details of any of this later, but I'll kind of move on. Um, so um, I think in general, yes, the American perception of Abe is very positive because of the, um, the fact that I think in, some, in many ways, you know, Abe delivered what the other prime ministers couldn't or wouldn't in terms of strengthening Japan's alliance with the United States. And in a way that Jennifer, I think, described uh, in some details. Um, and, uh, but of course, this is also happening in the context of the growing tension with China and today over Taiwan in particular. And uh, yes, I mean, I'm sort of worried about this because I don't live far away in the East Coast. I live in Japan. I worry about people in Okinawa. I really worry about the missiles getting, you know, are flying back and forth. And I don't really think that, you know, China can bully it into submission by a show of greater military force. So, um, but in terms of, you know, the democratic check, uh, so was Abe popular in Japan? Not really. And that's the graph you can see on the right-hand side of this slide. Uh, the red uh, line indicates the LDP share of the seats overall in the lower house. 2009 is the year when the LDP was in opposition. Then you can see it jumps to over 60% on its own. And together with Kometo, it goes over the two-third majority. Uh, but you also see uh, other lines in black. That's the voter turnout. The voter turnout used to be around 70% in 2009, then dropped sharply by 10 percentage point, And it has stayed at the historical lowest, hovering just above 50% mark in the recent elections. Uh, and uh, the last year I have here is 2017. But uh, the last year's election in 2021 under Kishida shows very little difference from this. The blue line is the line that is the most interesting. It's the share of the LDP votes in the single member district uh, part. You can see that it's basically flat. Uh, but on top of that, uh, what you see is that it's actually highest in 2009 when Aso was prime minister and the LDP lost against the DPJ uh, and you know, falling into opposition. Abe returned to power in December 2012 not by popular demand, by, but by the sharp drop in the turnout and the opposition division, which benefit, of course, the, uh, the largest party, the LDP. So without increasing even one vote, Abe continued to win three lower house elections in a row um, and uh, uh, have record number of seats consistently. So it's not like his agenda has been endorsed by uh, the people. It's more to do with disaffection, uh, people giving up, uh, getting disgusted from politics, um, finding the opposition parties to be too weak and divided, uh, but not because they fell in love with what Abe is doing. And I think that's one of the major problems with Abe's legacy, that he didn't carry the Japanese people with him. Uh, out, outside, I think you can see the elites and the managers of the alliance talking nicely about Japan getting on board, but other people on board, not really. Uh, and uh, I think that's that part of the issue. Of course, we live in a rather uh, you know, tense situation, and so the public opinion is divided. But you look at the Japanese people, uh, the Japanese media, people are barely educated about the issues even. And so I think that that is kind of, kind of worrisome development. And it also shows that, you know, the LDP just lost the uh, governorship election in Okinawa again, three losses in a row, uh, one loss in referendum. The building of Henoko, um, you know, our base is not being endorsed by the people in Okinawa by any means, but the government of Japan and uh, together with the US counterpart decided that it's not worth paying attention to. Uh, and uh, 
So you can talk about the democratic backsliding that happened under the 2012 system. And this is what I call the 2012 system. You have a new form of, uh, new form of um, one party dominance uh, together with a very strong connection with the bureaucracy. Uh, some characteristics in common with the 1955 system uh, but basically you have a more broken party system uh, since December 2012. And that's also one of the reasons why, I mean, yeah, I think we need to talk about this because we are not just looking back at Abe's legacy, but we are trying to understand Japan in the 20th, first century. I think Christina named this panel exactly that because we want to look a little bit into that crystal ball and figure out what's going to happen. And that's where my concern is. We have a very broken party system uh, we have a very broken system of check and balance. Uh, and uh, I kind of uh, underline the changes that happened, but the single member district has a way of exaggerating grossly the uh, share of the seats of the LDP in the past years after the collapse of the DPJ government. And now you have a one party dominance that is more uh, complacent, uh, more arrogant and unaccountable. Um, and the constitution has been severely undermined by the LDP government of late, even though during the 1955 system. Uh, and the contrast, of course, is back at the time, this was the context of the Cold War. Now you have the, you know, the international context of the US-China confrontation and Japan being expected to play a bigger role in regional security, uh, just like Jennifer explained. Uh, but the basic rule of the game has been changed uh, unilaterally. Um, so, um, what has been the collateral damage of Abe's militarization agenda, uh, the so-called move to the center, according to Jennifer? Well, repeated breach of constitutionalism. Article 7, uh, which uh, is about the dissolution of uh, the lower house, has always been sort of um, um, based on a rather expansive uh, interpretation of the constitution. But now, the LDP government doesn't even pretend to have a reason why it's constitutional for the cabinet to dissolve the law house, even though it's not written anywhere in the constitution. Uh, the executive branch has an extraordinary power uh, in that regard to just push the reset button when it pleases. Uh, Article nine, of course, uh, I disagree with Jennifer. Yes, of course, the process has been incremental in approaching of Article 9, but what happened with the cabinet decision in 2014 and the legislation in 2015 lifting the ban on collective self-defense is qualitatively different. Uh, now the Japanese self-defense force is talking about acquiring enemy strike capabilities. I don't see anything defensive about that part, really. Uh, and um, Article 53, extraordinary diet. According to Article 53, if a quarter or more of the members of either of the houses demand the opening of an extraordinary session of the Diet, the cabinet has to do it. The LDP and the Abe ignored that stipulation many times, and that practice has been carried over by Suga and by Kishida again. Now, like the opposition parties, who, which demand accountability from the government, have no recourse in opening the Diet. Um, and um, Article 85, 87 about the reserve fund, this has to do with uh, what's called yobihi in Japanese, the mushrooming of public funds uh, that are not accountable to the, uh, that has not been uh, approved by the diet, uh, goes against the very principle of fiscal democracy. Uh, and uh, the very reason why the parliament exists from the time of the glorious revolution, America war of independence. The whole point that John Locke and point about having a parliamentary democracy is to do about the parliament being able to check uh, the use of public funds. And that's not, you know, uh, that's losing effectiveness at the time when the defense spending is being pushed up. Um, the suppression of academic and press freedom the World Press Freedom Index fell this dramatically, and it's the lowest it says uh, under Kishida still today. Uh, the purging of critical academics from government councils and the Science Council of Japan, which is in the breach of Science Council of Japan law, Article 7.2 and 17, uh, which Kishida has 
like uh, it, it was done under Suga and Abe's influence, and now Ishida is not changing that either. Um, it, it's a matter of serious concern. Um, and there are further concerns about the extension of police power and the suppression of civil liberties, revised wiretapping laws, state secrets law, conspiracy law, all give more power to the police to, for police surveillance at the time when the people are uh, be having uh, key secrets hidden uh, from the public view uh, in a way that is thoroughly unaccountable. One thing that is not, uh, not that well known, but nevertheless true, is the fact that also the police bureaucrats are ha having a great time ever since Abe became prime minister. Um, the uh, National Police Agency uh, used not to supply the deputy chief cabinet secretary, Hamburg Jokan, the top bureaucrat, in Kante, in the Prime Minister's office. The practice has been resumed. It's, it was stopped in 1976. Uh, and then, you know, it was too political to have the top bureaucrat coming from the police. Uh, they stopped that then. ASO actually revived it uh, in 2008 uh, for just one year. After DPJ came back to power, they stopped that practice. Abe revived it in 2012. Sugita Kazuhiro uh, has served for a long time. Uh, but Ishida has reappointed somebody from the National Police Agency, obviously having data, all the information about the security police and stuff in their hand. Uh, so this is how badly partisan the bureaucracy has also become. Uh, there is also this notorious case of sexual assault incident of a young female journalist by, uh, by a hagiographer of Abe's, uh, whose uh, arrest warrant was canceled at the last minute by the uh, former uh, by somebody who was to uh, go up further to be the National Police Agency head, Nakamura, who just retired because of the uh, Abe assassination um, uh, fiasco. Uh, but um, the fact that somebody, uh, you know, apply apparently political pressure uh, on the police to uh, protect um, uh, a close, you know, a, a journalist close to Abe on a rape case, uh, sexual assault case, and then um, then that police bureaucrat getting promoted to be the top bureaucrat is concerning. Um, then there's historical revisionism and its legacy. Abe has learned, yes, no doubt about it, to contain historical revisionism within the boundary of what the Americans permit. Uh, he was very good at learning at that. He didn't know that quite well uh, when he visited Yaskuni Shrine. He learned it the hard way uh, over time. Uh, but uh, there's been a complementarity between US dependent reforms. Uh, when you think about the other prime ministers who caused controversy by visiting Yasukuni Shrine, Nakasone, uh, or um, Hashimoto, Koizumi, all they have been, the, you know, praises uh, being showered by the American reformists. Uh, but they also needed the nationalist support uh, in order to push through these revisions, uh, reforms. So that's not a coincidence. Uh, and then Abe was seriously engaged in an overseas uh, official campaign. Uh, it became a matter of LDP official policy. They actually put it in a campaign manifesto in the election in December 2014 to propagate a correct view of Japan to the world. And uh, there are many episodes that I can get into some details if you want to. But basically, that comes to an end in, uh, in December 2015, as it back, badly backfired. And the, hence the uh, agreement on the comfort woman issue with Pakune in, in Korea, and uh, again, and the American prodding. Um, but I think the key thing here is that revisionism has won and prevailed to inside Japan to date. Uh, the muzzling of the media, uh, the NHK, Asahi are never the same again since the attacks uh, or the attempt at control. There's been attacks on historians, academics, feminist scholars who've been defamed by Sugita, for example, uh, on, on their research about the comfort woman issue. Uh, whistled, you know, uh, dog whistle politics. I've been put on a blacklist by MOFA uh, not to be interviewed uh, by the foreign journalists. It's not pleasant. Uh, I tend not to care about these things, but some people do, and they are getting muzzled. Um, Revisionist domination of the public space, IT Triennale in 2019, uh, you had the cancellation uh, of the exhibit because of the 
uh, the, the girl statue uh, on, of the perfect woman issue. So I worry about Japan's isolation in East Asia. America is not everything Japan has. Japan is located in East Asia. Japan stopped to have an independent East Asia policy um, uh, ever since Abe returned to power. There was not that much during the DPJ government either, I admit it. But you know, it's been a longer term trend that Abe really turned it to the worst. And the persistent misogyny and gender backlash in Japan is horrifying. And it's, uh, it's packaged together with the revisionism. There's no doubt about it, why they are so obsessed about the comfort woman issue. Um, well, I, I need to uh, bring this to a close. So finally, about the major scandals, the Moritomo Pake Sakura scandal. They may appear like trivial scandals, but they are not, because personalization of power, power that is unaccountable to the people, and not even to the laws uh, are the common root, uh, the common root cause, and they also take two stages in general. The first stage is about the breach of equality before the law and procedure, procedural fairness by Abe and his cronies in order for them to gain illicit private gains. But then the most serious part is the second part. There is a systemic cover up each time to protect Abe, leading to further destruction of the rule of law the system of check and balance and democratic accountability. Uh, Abe is the king, he had to be protected. So the bureaucrats bent over backwards to destroy public documents, to burn, you know, to uh, shred them, to lie in the parliament many times, and they get away with it. Uh, and that kind of political system, to me, doesn't really seem to offer sufficient counterbalance, sufficient check on the abuses of executive power. It's not just about, you know, um, what's happening about democratic backsliding in the US or in Hungary or elsewhere. Japan is also in that sort of category. And when you think of the uh, militarization, uh, to me, it doesn't really look like it's just moving to the center. Uh, and finally, the unification church scandal and the state funerals as Abe's final two state scandal. Um, this is you know, an attempt to cover up Abe, to mystify Abe, to uh, turn into him into a hero, to whitewash his legacy, uh, and to try to sort of somehow bury the Unification Church uh, scandal in that way. And uh, my main question is, will the 2012 system outlive him? Uh, Kishida is having a hard time to be the bully that Abe or Suga was, uh, were, but uh, with the system going to stay with us. And I think, I fear that that will be the biggest longer term legacy of Abe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Koichi. I am very glad you continue to speak up and will not be silenced. It is um, fascinating to hear your perspective. And I'd like to now quickly turn to our audience, which has already submitted many questions. And because we're in a webinar and coming up to the end of our time, I'm going to go ahead and summarize questions and group them together and then ask you to respond. Um, so first we have Kentaro Yamamoto, who is one of the associates with the program on US-Japan relations this year, studying Japanese party politics. He is a professor of political science at Hokkaido Gakuen University. He's interested in asking um, Professor Lind whether you think that Prime Minister Kishida's loss in popularity is going to change his ability to have an independent foreign policy. He notes that your presentation says Japan is shifting to center left. And of course the trends of the rise of China makes one think that the natural path of Japan's security would be to become a little more conservative. But now with prime minister Kishida having lower popularity due to various controversies, with his pacifist orientation, is he going to shift things left or is he going to stay on the conservative track set by Prime Minister Abe? So if you could hold an answer to that question. We also have uh, interest in what your opinions are about the state funeral to be held next week and whether um, this is appropriate. And professor of Boston University, Thomas Berger, asks Koichi Nakano that there's an old saying in the US, you can't beat something with nothing. One can argue that while Abe's ideological message may not be entirely convincing, 
The problem in Japan is that the opposition has completely failed to provide a convincing alternative. So the problem is not the electoral system or other institutions. The DPJ won in 2009, Hosokawa won in 1993, and therefore we could have others, Dick Samuels and others arguing that Japan's secrecy laws and surveillance is not that strong compared to other countries, just as Jenny has said, the defense spending is low compared to other countries. So then the problem is more about the lack of vision in the opposition parties that are opposed to the LDP. And what is your view on this? We also, um, just wrapping up, as you think about why is voter turnout low and Abe cabinet not able to gain more popularity? So with your knowledge of domestic politics, what do you think is um, the source of that inability to muster more support within the public? I could continue, but I think I better let you ask a couple, find a couple of responses. And if you can answer briefly, we might get to one last question. Um, I, I can respond. Um, thanks for these, these interesting questions. And, and hi to, to Tom Berger in Boston. <laughs> Again, someone I haven't seen in a while. Um, I, I was intrigued by the, the question that, that talked about like perhaps this, um, this move more toward the center or some would say toward the right is inevitable because of, of China's rise and what we see in Ukraine. And, and I would say that it's certainly not inevitable and, and that we're seeing that with Japan's behavior. Uh, there's a lot of people who would say, uh, this is what countries should do in, in response to you know, realist theories of international politics. If there's this threat that comes up, then the country should, you know, should move uh, to be a more assertive country, um, internal mobilization, stronger alliances, and so on. Um, but, but again, it's not inevitable. There, there, there's a, a whole other position that, that Japan might take, and, and I would say it seems to be taking it. Uh, that Japan is is not doing um, what if if it were really interested in preventing Chinese dominance in East Asia, it would be behaving very differently. And so we're seeing that Japan is is taking uh, is believing that it can um, maybe hope that Japan sorry that the China's intentions will be um, will will be confined to certain elements and, and not more expansive than some people feel. Um, maybe that China will keep the trade lanes open and, and that won't behave in such egregious ways that Japan will really feel pressed for this. And so that kind of a view would say, as Professor Nakano was suggesting, focus on the economy, focus on some of these other things that we should be focusing on right now, the many problems in Japanese society that internally we face. And that's a perfectly defensible view. It, I mean, there's enough evidence for that view. I, I, I mean, there's plenty of evidence for that view that you can make a pretty strong case. There's another view that would say, um, China looks pretty dangerous and, and it's a pretty big gamble to think that it's not gonna get more offensively minded toward Japan. And you could support that argument too. But again, just coming back to, there's just absolutely nothing inevitable about um, that oh of course Japan is going to move in a in a more militaristic direction, uh, particularly in the context that Professor Nakano is is helping us look at the the context of Japan after World War II. Um, in terms of uh, some of the other points you brought up, um, I, I have absolutely no opinion on the state funeral issue, <laughs> and I will just keep my myself out of it, keep my American mouth out of it, because you don't need to hear us tell you what to do. Um, I, I, it's probably something similar in the United States, like uh, the policy of when when a public figure is uh, dies and then then is um, their their body is is in the capital rotunda and for how long and right so there's all these sensitive questions in terms of what makes somebody important enough to to merit that and um i know from our politics that it's a very messy very contested thing and so i would never presume to tell japan who is so important or who is not important uh that that, that would be something that 
somebody should weigh it on, but um, Nakano-san can weigh in on it because he's Japanese. <laughs> All right, so I'll be answering the questions that I were given, okay? Yes, and can I just add on, both of our associates, Willie Zhao and Trevor and Charity, are really interested in hearing what specific institutions do you attribute as causing the democratic backsliding? Electoral institutions that have contributed or could be changed. Mm. Please go ahead. Right, right, thank you. Um, well, it's kind of, I mean, maybe I start with that question because I was just given that last, but um, uh, it's not to put one finger on it, but I think, you know, because um, the ties, for example, between, I mean, this also answers the question of, from Tom Berger about the, why does the opposition party, because, you know, I get asked that all the time, to be honest. And, you know, it's not hard to notice that the opposition parties in Japan are weak and divided and completely incapable of really mounting a severe challenge. I'm personally working with them and I know how bad they are, yes. But then I'm also puzzled why people keep on blaming the opposition for the failure of Japanese politics and overlook the LDP ties and all the wrong things they do. Their corruption, their control of the media, the twisting of the campaign rules. Right now, the lower house election campaign period, official campaign period, meaning that if you start officially campaigning before that, you'll be caught is only 12 days. I'm not saying we should introduce an American style primary, but in the earlier postal period, it was like 25 days. Okay, so now it's start, it's done, right? And uh, yes, of course, there's also tons of criticism about the opposition parties aligned, for example, with the Communist Party. Nobody talks about the LDP aligning itself with the Cometo. Uh, and so you expect the main opposition party to head on you know, single-handedly against the LDP, allied with the Sokagakkai, and then plus unification church and state Shintoism and all that sort of thing. I don't see the double standard, it's just bizarre. So yes, election is a big part of it, but there is also, you know, decades long, or in fact, century long collusion with the bureaucracy, with the governing party. The LDP started as an extended uh, political branch of the bureaucracy. Uh, and uh, in many ways, of course, you know, the bureaucrats are very hostile. When the DPJ came to power, you had more, more of a bureaucrats running to American embassy and saying, don't be soft on Hatoyama, on Henoko issue, right? And uh, so, yeah, and they get away with it. Uh, and so, yes, of course, the opposition parties have a hard time winning and uh, it's to do with all kinds of institutions. But now the main problem, of course, is that they are, you know, sort of uh, launching themselves on a full-fledged assault on the constitution as a whole, the delegitimizing it. And so then you won't have the basic rule of the game. And that's qualitatively different in terms of the behavior of the LDP in the post-war period. So in that sense, the collapse of the, or the uh, succumbing to pressure of the cabinet legislation bureau uh, was quite key in that regard. Uh, they were, you know, the more realistic bulwark against arbitrary interpretation of the constitution. But Abe changed that in 2013, if I remember correctly. And since then, it's not, it's not the same. The Supreme Court has always been very conservative in Japan. Uh, everybody knows about it. So, you know, so you have all these kind of problems that precede Abe, but then he brought in some really important qualitative difference. Uh, the low voter turnout, the inability of mastering more votes on the LDP side. Well, I think, you know, again, there are lots of different reasons. And the other thing, some people have been looking at the um, coverage on the media about the elections. And they also point the fact that, you know, the media coverage of electoral campaign has really dropped over time because it's not interesting and it doesn't get good ratings, right? So, of course, people don't even really know that the election is taking place. Uh, if, you know, it's barely on television. Uh, and uh, so you get, you know, in Japan, you get notoriously get the biggest coverage of the election after people voted. And the announcement, you know, the results are announced. You know, that's not really very healthy democracy, if you ask me. And it's hard to expect voters to turn out in greater number if that continues. But it was back in 2000 that Modi, uh, the Gakron former prime minister, notorious even recently, you know, as the head of the Tokyo 2020, uh, women knowing their place and stuff, uh, 
as prime minister, when he was facing the prospect of an election, he said he hoped people you know, take a nap instead of going to the election. He spoke his mind because the LDP in the past, like in 1955 system, it was actually a party that would gain seats and votes if greater number of people showed up. But that changed. The LDP knows that the first, uh, you know, the first possible system is a system in which you just need to you know, defeat the nearest opponent. And it's better to sort of weaken them rather than you becoming more popular. So actually people not showing up to vote is LDP strategy. Uh, you see today even like celebrities, musicians and so forth, you know, uh, taking matters in their own hand and trying to raise awareness and votes, but the government is not interested in pushing up the vote. So this is why I'm sort of worried about the slow death of Japanese liberal democracy uh, as a bulwark against the abuse of power and unwarranted exercise of military power. Jenny, did you want to jump in on the democratic backsliding? Yeah, I, th I think this is a really interesting issue to bring up um, in the, the era that we're living. Uh, this is a really important thing for, for all of us who live in democracies. And, um, you know, when we were all students, we, we read that part in our comparative politics books that says, oh, actually, if you haven't had a handover of a power to an opposition party, it's not a democracy. And we all said, wait, what? <laughs> because we're thinking about Japan. And so that that was pretty eye-opening. And, and again, that's one, one definition of a democracy is you have to have that turnover and this is disputed and so on. But but I, I just wanna, I wanna comment that um, uh, what Nakano-san is bringing up is, is really, really important and, and something that, that we've been deeply worried about in the United States about our own country. And we're certainly worried about seeing this in, in other countries around the world. And I think people do think of Japan as a just deeply successful democracy, but that um, you know our respect for Japan's democracy shouldn't blind us to the possibility that there might be backsliding. Um, I'll, I'll just say you know the the extent to which we are seeing backsliding it would depend on us evaluating a whole range of indicators. So when, when social scientists are trying to assess the, the quality of governance in a country, they, they look at many different indicators. And, um, and Nakano-san brought up one, one issue, the, the sort of the media, the effort to contain the media, shape media coverage and so on. And there was definitely some disturbing stories that were coming out of Japan during Abe's era. And, and what I can say is, is that I saw certainly some pretty clumsy attempts to control the narrative. Um, and then some that were, you know, as, as he mentioned, a little more disturbing than clumsy. And, and I always thought it was so unfortunate because I, I think that as people who live in democracies, we have to kind of embrace the messiness, right? We have to embrace the fact that there are a lot of people who disagree and there are gonna be, if you're a public official, there's gonna be a lot of people who disagree with you. And so absolutely you have the right to get your message out and to do your best to communicate that message and so on. But but some of these rather clumsy and dubious ways that that I saw that going on was, was really just not, um, not one of the more impressive aspects of this government, we can certainly agree on. Um, but I'll also just say, um, you know, it before we want, we would conclude that, oh, we are seeing some disturbing backsliding in Japan, we do want to examine a range of indicators. And we, we want to look at not just the strength of evaluative institutions, for example, like the media, like civil society, universities, and so on. Um, but voting laws and the accountability of different institutions, different parts of the government to each other, we call that horizontal accountability. And then there's the vertical accountability, which the evaluative institutions like the media help keep the government accountable to the people. And, and you know, I'll, I'll just say that the, the greatest asset that Japan has in this effort are people on this call 
right? It's the smart, skeptical people. It's the Nakano-sans and the Yamamoto-sans and the Burger-sans and, and all of you out there um, who are skeptical, who are watching, who are committed to democracy and, and who are going to speak up. And that's what I was really impressed to see during the, the Trump years in my own country is, is colleagues who said, wait a minute, this is not acceptable. And, um, you know, some of them might have felt like speaking up didn't have a whole lot of effect, but we got to keep fighting the fight. And so um, kudos for doing that. And there's so much where Abe was breaking norms in saying some things that hadn't been said or taking different approaches. And the question is, will that become the new normal? I mean, that's what we worry about in the US context where all of the norms that were broken by President Trump now set a new benchmark for the next leaders. And so Brendan McGowan asks a question about how do we see the precedent of Abe in terms of shifting what future prime ministers will be able to do? And is this going to be the new approach? And in particular, as we're thinking about foreign policy, there's the question where there's more cabinet centralization. And here, Nakano-san, you talked about this idea of the bureaucratic strength as part of the democratic backsliding. And so we certainly, under Prime Minister Abe, saw you know, everything from TPP headquarters for trade policy to a National Security Council on foreign policy. So is that going to be a new approach to foreign policy? And how do we think about, you know, Jun Xiaoling asking about the imperialist expansion of the LDP and what are the ways you could engage in resistance if you don't like the rhetoric that was coming out of some of the fringe and sometimes from this mainstream of the party. And so I wondered, you know, if we were to think about what is the appropriate way to push back when we feel norms have been breached on what is an appropriate form of dialogue about Japan's foreign policy, given all of the historical sensitivities. So those are two sort of broad questions about how do we take the legacy of Abe and go forward? Um, we're coming up near our end of our time, so I'm going to ask each of you just to have a little brief comment about how you think we should take the Abe legacy going forward. I'll start with uh, Nakano-san and then go to uh, Jenny. Sure, sure, thank you. Now, these are very both very good questions. I think in terms of the uh, uh, those kind of legacies, um, I think, you know, again, I mean, I also want to emphasize that it didn't really all of a sudden start with Abe. Uh, it started with the neoliberalization of politics in general, this idea of kind of presidential power of the prime minister, concentration of power in the country. And again, Japan is not the only case. I mean, I do agree with Jennifer in terms of, you know, other countries are shifting to the right as well. I mean, you can say that in terms of nationalism, you can say about this, about executive dominance, Caesarian president in the United States is not something Trump began. Maybe he's just crazier than the others. But Obama abused plenty of executive orders as well. So it's a systemic change that's been happening. And as people who believe in liberal democracy, we are worried. Uh, but you know, let me go back to Abe. So what happened in terms of that, I guess, is that um, uh, after now Abe is, is gone, I think you know the system that I call 2012 system is going to continue to look for somebody who is going to be like Abe, because otherwise you can't really stabilize the system. The power has become so centered around the country that the bureaucrats, Christina, you may know much more than I do about other ministries, but you know, they're probably sort of thinking that, okay, well, can't they decide? And so we just take the orders. Whoever are sort of bossing around in the country, the prime minister's office are going to, you know, give us directions. And so people who want to go up would be looking at whoever is in Kante, how long is it going to last? Because it's always going to be a key. And, um, you know, that kind of thing, I think, is really going to look for uh, a real problem. And I think, you know, it began with Koizumi, really. 
uh, Kuzumi was the master of the abuse of the single member district system. He's the one who benefited from the central government reorganization that centralized power under Kante Takenaka Hezo as his right hand man in the reform process. Uh, that really did so much damage to the Japanese economy uh, in terms of, you know, the gap between the rich and the poor. Uh, all these things, I think, have been, you know, and then, of course, after Koizumi, what happened, you had a period of drift because nobody quite matched Koizumi in terms of centralization power. And now we have the same situation. My guess is that we're going to drift some time, one year prime minister, maybe Kishida is going to be somewhat more lucky because there's no major national election coming up anytime soon. But I have a hard time imagining him re winning re-election as the president of the LDP uh, two years from now, right? And so, you know, maybe one year prime minister, two year prime minister is going to continue until I don't know who is going to come again and again act in a way that is entirely unaccountable to the people because the embedded, decentralized, wiser, more moderate check and balance system in the government and in the diet and in the judiciary, the police, they are gone. Uh, so you basically depend on the popularity, the political capital the prime minister has. And that's, to me, is really not how the liberal democracy should be functioned. So what to do? Well, I'm trying to bring in, I mean, I personally am sort of an activist as well. Uh, and uh, I sort of talk to the civic activists. I work with them. I try to rally the opposition parties to overcome differences, to agree to unify candidates together so that they can present a more effective challenge it's extraordinarily difficult and it's like you know uh it's like uh, yeah it's almost like it feels futile sometimes but i think that's the only way you can do it because as i explained earlier the institutional change happens in multiple ways but at the at the heart of it is really about electoral politics i think the fact that the first past the system twisted uh democracy in such a bizarre way in japan being introduced upon not a two-party system or that already existed but rather one party dominance has an effect of really embedding LDP power. And so until the opposition parties can start to bring in more balance again, uh, and I don't see that happening anytime soon. I mean, you know, I'm sort of speaking as a scholar. Uh, if I'm addressing a civic rally, I'll be a bit more optimistic to be honest. But here, honestly, as a scholar, I think it's still going to be a long time ahead, but there's no alternative. Thank you. Thank you. Jenny? So if, if we're thinking about Abe's legacy in terms of um, the security dimension, again, uh, him making an effort to shift Japan toward a more assertive policy, one that, you know, we would say a normal realist policy in which Japan is responding uh, to its growing increasingly dangerous threat environment with particularly with respect to to China um so so that's a legacy that I would definitely put in the the category of unfinished business right so I think that's my my the broad way I'd refer to a few different things so the unfinished business of the the kind of Japanese balancing um and and this is a legacy that the Japanese people have to decide um how do you feel about going further in this direction? So Abe's giving you a vision, and that that vision was um, more more effort, but still pretty moderate, still nested within this U.S. Japan alliance, um, but playing a, a more active role relative to the past. Maybe uh, again. Um, um, constitutional reform, maybe strike capabilities. Again, so there's, if you continue going in that direction, that's the, the kind of things that, that we would be talking about. And I, I again, it's the, the Japanese people have to decide how do we feel about that? And it would be really helpful, if, as Thomas Berger mentioned, if they had another vision that was put before them where they could choose between different visions. Um, so there's there's here's Abe's diagnosis of the the security environment and and the Japanese conservatives their diagnosis and the Americans their diagnosis so they're telling the people of Japan here's our view of your security environment and here's what you should do and so the Japanese people can listen to that and see what they think of it it would be really helpful 
if there was another diagnosis of the security environment other than those voices. Uh, it would be really helpful if there was another vision for a Japanese security policy. And then Japan could, could truly uh, choose between those rather than just sort of this feeling of we're just sort of, we're, we're just, just keep paddling, right? <laughs> we're, we're just gonna kind of keep going uh, until something something huge happens and we have to change. That's probably not the best strategy. So um, so it would be helpful if they had another vision and, and we really don't see a lot of that. I mean, I, I wrote an article on, I called it Life in China's Asia. Um, and it was mostly aimed at the Japanese people <laughs> basically saying, you got to think about what this is going to look like. And then you can have a debate amongst yourselves about how secure you feel living in that environment. And as I said before, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that it would necessarily be terrible for Japan. Um, uh, you know, American as uh, United States as a regional hegemon was pretty darn annoying toward its neighbors and annoying is a really kind word that I'm using here. So um, regional hegemons can be pretty, pretty bossy and and sometimes pretty violent. So anyway, it's a it's an important thing to, to think about what is that going to look like. Um, another category, we'll just one real thing real quickly because I'm really glad Nakano-san brought it up. Another category that I very much put under unfinished business is the, the issue of gender in Japan, gender equality. Um, Abe said some, some great slogans, um, but I don't think pushed Japan nearly as far as it needs to go. And I can tell you so many stories about going to all male panels telling the audience that women are the future of Japan. And I just couldn't believe it. Um, so again, that's another area where we saw leadership, um, but unfinished business. And in that respect, um, I think it would really be a great thing for Japan to, to keep moving in that direction. Thank you so much. You have really provoked us all to think more deeply and I hope your voices are also reaching audiences in Japan as you say to articulate both what would be an alternative vision to Prime Minister Abe and to reflect on the valuable contributions he made in putting forward a vision about the need for a stronger defense policy and uh, articulating uh, support for free trade at a time when many countries were backing away from free trade. And so as we think about his legacy and what are the next steps for Japan, it's really important to keep in mind um, the institutional changes, those worries for democracy, the comparative perspective, and I appreciate you both bringing that to us today in the seminar. Thank you to the audience who brought a lot of great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get through all of the questions. And thank you so much for the staff of the program, U.S. Japan Relation, Shinji Fujihida, Sophie Welsh, and Jennifer Christ for supporting the, promoting the seminar. Good night, everyone. And I hope the rest of your day is good for those in Japan. Thank you so much for joining us for uh, our first kickoff to the seminar. We hope you'll come back for future events. Thank you so much. Thanks.